Entrepreneurial Edge is brought to you by Business Banking from FNB because small ideas can lead to big business. FNB, how can we help you? Hello and a very warm welcome to the Entrepreneurial Edge. I'm Chris Bishop. This week we go into the world of banking to see how an entrepreneur has made it. This has been where Stephen Clark has spent the last 12 years working as an entrepreneur. Among other things, his company owns a piece of technology called Switch that allows independent payment services to interact with the big banks. Let's take a look at what he does. PayCorp is South Africa's only full payments services company, offering payment streams across ATMs, card issuing, um, and card processing. Um, PayCorp owns its own transaction switch, which allows it to connect into all of the major banks in the country, um, effectively into the national payments uh, mechanism. In 1999, Stephen Clark uh, read a, a magazine article in Forbes magazine, and it was about three young guys in the US who had a really successful ATM company. So he popped them an email, and lo and behold, they actually responded. Um, and although they didn't want to go into business with him at that time, they introduced him to the ATM manufacturer. And armed with entrepreneurial spirit, he jumped on an airplane, met with these guys, um, and came back with a container load of ATMs. Now the banking relationships were a little bit more complex, but with a bit of luck, in uh, 2000, the first ATM was installed. And since then, an ATM has been installed every day. So today, we have a network of 4,500 ATMs in South Africa across retail locations. In 2004, Stephen added another payment stream into the business and co-founded DrawCard uh, with Phil Froome. So DrawCard is the, was the first non-bank issuer of prepaid gift cards in the country and launched South Africa's first ever Visa gift card, payroll card, incentive card and insurance claims card. Uh, DrawCard has major, major retailers and corporates as clients and is a very successful business today. In 2005, the third leg of the business was started with FPOS, which provides point of sale terminals and card processing functionality, primarily to small and medium businesses across the country, enabling retailers to accept card payments. The transaction switch is the cornerstone of PayCorp's toolkit and all of the subsidiaries leverage off this toolkit and in combination with the technical expertise um, and the best of breed compliance, the unique culture really sets this company apart. Stephen Clark's mantra is to have fun, make money and do good in that order. And this innovative thinking really enables the company to come up with new solutions in this ever-changing environment. Well, that's what he did. How did he do it? Well, in the studio, we've got Stephen Clark, the group CEO and founder of PayCorp Holdings, to tell us what happened. So, just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, Stephen. Did you come from an entrepreneurial family? I, uh, my life as an entrepreneur started out of, ne out of necessity. Uh, my father, unfortunately, died when I was very young, when I was five years old. My mom brought up four boys. I was the youngest of four boys. I had jobs all the way through from 12 until now. I've actually had to make my own job. and. Uh, uh, I've been, uh, my first job was when I was 12 years old, I was in a paper route, all the way through to owning stands in flea markets through university and now the ATM business. From the, what was your first sort of entrepreneurial act? You said you were like 12, you started working, delivering papers. What, yeah. what gave you the first idea of turning your own money? Well, it was, my mom said to me, if you want some pocket money, best you get a job. That was the necessity <laughs> for entrepreneurship early on. And um, from there, so you obviously went, went, went to college. Um, what was going through your mind then? Uh, I went to WITS. I studied a BCom in finance. Uh, after that, I did a postgrad in business administration through Thames University uh, when I'd been working for a few years. But I thought that a good education, a good foundation on top of hope, hopefully a good entrepreneurial bias would have stood me in good stead. Now you've done the groundwork, you've done the, the background, the studying, but uh, I understand your life changed one morning in 1999 when you bought a copy of Forbes magazine, that very famous entrepreneurial magazine. And it really was Forbes, not because there's any relationship here between you guys and Forbes, but I saw an <laughs> article in Forbes magazine uh, describe the success of these three guys, Steve, Dave and Jeff, uh, and at that time they were the largest ATM company in America. 
I was employed at a public company. It wasn't public when I started there. It became public halfway through. Uh, and I was looking for a business to get into. I got a bit tired of the corporate life. I saw this article. It described the success of these guys. Uh, I sent them an email. I said, are you interested in expanding internationally? They said, well, no, not really. And that was the start of my adventure into the ATM space. I went, flew over to the States. I met up with them, and they really opened their arms to me, showed me how the ATM business worked. I came back to South Africa, had to start looking for some funding to start this business. Uh, and that was the start. It was the, the end of 1999, the beginning of 2000. And that was our entree into the ATM business. But one of these great things, isn't it? I mean, I mean, I'm learning about entrepreneurialism is that actually reading and listening to other entrepreneurs is the great driver of business in my view. What do you think? There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Actually, interestingly enough, when I was looking for a life change to move out of the corporate environment into something a little bit more entrepreneurial, doing my own thing. I mean, I used to read. I'm, I'm a voracious reader. I read anything I can get my hands on. I mean, I'll read the back of a cigarette box. <laughs> so um, uh, what happened was I, I kept a list of uh, magazines that I'd read or books or shows. Uh, I mean at that time the internet was just uh, you know gaining traction of great ideas that I saw and the ATM, uh, the ATM space seemed to me like an absolute killer. So uh, I think you can learn a lot by reading, there's no doubt. But in the, the cold light of day you, you actually decided you were going to start this business here yep. in, in the country of your birth. Uh, just, just tell us how humble were those beginnings? Uh, as I said, they were really humble. I grew up uh, a, in a great family environment, but with no dad. My mother worked literally seven days a week, literally seven days a week to bring up four boys. We were fortunate that at school we were all reasonably good, uh, and that held us in good stead. We got university degrees and postgrads and the like, but our, our beginnings were relatively humble. There was no money to fall back on. Um, but this business, just at day one of the business that you now have now, that when you read Forbes magazine, you came up with the idea? So I came up with the idea, went over to the US, found out a lot about the ATM business, the way it worked in the States. I came back to South Africa. I thought it was a great idea. I then started looking for funding. Uh, How difficult was that? It was impossible. It was actually impossible. We went to see people in the community, venture capitalists and the like, and that was a lesson. That was a lesson for me, which I'll tell you about. Okay, what, what were the tough lessons? Tell well, us. Well, the, the tough lesson is uh, uh, the real brand names that you hope will provide you funding, and we saw them all in the early stages. They thought it looked like a good idea, and we were prepared to give away a lot of the business just to get the funding in. In the end, not a single one of them came through, or well, not without massive strings attached. So the best funder, the, the first and best funder in our business was the three F's. You know, the three F's is friends, family, and fools. <laughs> and they funded it. We took out my life savings, uh, my business partner, his brother, my brother, the auntie, the uncle, and friends. And they were the original capital in the business. We started with 250,000 in capital. We raised about two and a half million, and that was the business. Why did you think people were so skeptical? I mean, at the time, ATMs was reasonably well known around the world as well as here. Well, if you think about it, so we went to see a potential <laughs> investor. They said, "Okay, so let me let me get this straight. You're going to install ATMs in competition with the bank, with the self-same people that you need to provide you connectivity, who are better equipped, better funded, with more expertise." Um, you know, maybe you shouldn't quit your day job. That was really the lesson. So uh, we had belief. We thought our model had merit, and it's been, you know, it's proven as such. Why? Why didn't you give up? I mean, a lot of people would have done. Uh, I had belief in the model. I, th I knew that we would we would get the funding from some place, which we did more out of necessity. Uh, we thought that the model was sound. There is international present, uh, precedent. It's not that we're great innovators, but we were wonderful imitators. We saw what worked elsewhere. And we thought that this thing had absolute uh, application in South Africa. And we knew that we just needed to get going, and the rest would be history. And what do you remember about that first day you opened the doors? What happened then? Thank goodness the power didn't go off. That was <laughs> um, when we opened the doors. Look, uh, we, we started out with a, a fantastic team of people who had belief in the, uh, in the model. And the bulk of them are still with us. Uh, and we knew we were on a good, th we were onto a good thing early on in the game. We went to see the big four banks originally, to say, well, can you provide us connectivity into the into the payment system? They said, no, not really. Uh, we got connection through Sambo in the early early days. Uh, we rolled out our first machine on the, uh, in early 2000, 23rd of uh, March to be exact. Uh, to be exact, and as Bronwyn said earlier, uh, we've installed an ATM machine every single day since. 
It's amazing. I mean, but surely that, that must have been very discouraging as well when the big banks, I mean, in some ways they can say, well, it's our business. I'm sorry, you've got no business coming in and asking us to cooperate. It is interesting, but, you know, at that time, and what, what is the, the international precedent is that the big banks concentrated their efforts primarily on their branch machines and they left off-site machines, machines that are in supermarkets and petrol stations and convenience stores. They left more to independent companies such as ours. But in South Africa, by necessity, the big banks had to get into the branch machine business and big, uh, what they call off-site, off-premise ATMs. But that left a whole market of retailers who wanted ATM machines uh, that was being underserviced by the bank. So when we went to see them, we said, look, concentrate your efforts on your core, work with a company such as ours, Initially, they were skeptical and hasn't, you know, they weren't interested. But today, we deploy for Standard Bank, we deploy for NetBank, we deploy for ABSA. So, by and large, if you're using one of the ATM machines in a retail location, there's a very good chance that it might actually be one of ours. So, it's actually come full circle. If I could actually ask a layman's question here, what was stopping the banks from just putting an ATM machine in a shop or a petrol station? I mean, they were there. Just, you know, when we started out in 1999, there were ATMs, and maybe around here where we live, ATMs were commonplace, but that wasn't that wasn't the market as a whole. There were, you know, uh, the rise of convenience stores and petrol station convenience stores. There was just very limited penetration of ATMs, and the banks at that time still looked at an ATM as an extension of their branch infrastructure, get people out of their branches onto using an ATM. But that negated that there was a whole whack of retailer demand, retailers who wanted ATM machines in their place of business. The banks were maybe either unwilling or unable to provide the service, the, the service uh, but there was retailer demand. Our customers, and still today, are the retailers. We provide ATM machines to retailers in collaboration and cooperation with the big banks. And uh, at that time, presumably, you were the only one doing this. The start. You saw that gap in the yeah, market. Yeah, saw the gap. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were a couple of other guys kind of sniffing around, but we got in early. Um, I think in the first 18 months, Chris, we put in about 600 machines. That was, I believe at that time, that was more than the big four banks had put in, put together. That's as a startup with no funding, uh, some limited abilities, but you know, some drive and maybe some, uh, 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 some guts. Stephen Cuck, the CEO of Paycorp. We're going to talk a lot more in the second half. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to a short ad break now. We'll see you right after this.